Vienna Gödel Lecture at TU Wien. I welcome all who came here in person here to TU Sky, I think one of the nicest venues uh, of TU Wien, but also particularly those who join us via Zoom or YouTube from all over the world. This is already the eighth edition of the Vienna Girl Lecture Series, which uh, was started in 2013 by uh, a lecture of Donald Knuth. Today's speaker, Professor Moshe Wadi, um, joins us via Zoom from, from Houston, Texas. And before I have the honor of introducing him, I give the floor to our rector, Professor Sabine Seidler, for her welcoming words. Thank you very much. Dear Professor Wadi, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you at more or less Theobin and to introduce the Gödel Lecture 2021. Last year, the year of the 50th anniversary of the Faculty of Informatics, the lecture was cancelled due to COVID-19. Some weeks ago, the Dean of the Faculty of Informatics wrote me, this year we are wiser. We will welcome our guest speaker, Professor Moshevadi virtually, and we do so now. Best greetings from Vienna to Texas. The series of Gödel lectures we have heard it was established in 2013 by the Faculty of Informatics of TU Wien to increase the attractiveness of Vienna to world renowned computer scientists and to raising its profile as an academic hotspot. At this time, we all became the first ideas about the power of the transformation process that we now call digitalization. Computer science assumes a central position in this process, and the Gödel lectures are one of many contributions of Theo Wien in general, and the Faculty of Informatics in particular, to emphasize the importance of technology and especially computer science and their significance to explaining and shaping the world in which we live today. Our society is heavily based on the exchange of information, which gives us rise to a special responsibility for research and education in informatics. The last 15 months have shown us very clearly where we are currently stand in the process of digital transformation. In society in general, and thus naturally also at universities. We have seen our strengths and weaknesses, but we have also gained an impression of the university of the future. I'm sure we are facing a great challenge because the nature and structure of universities will be hybrid. They will be open as physical and virtual spaces and will work to cultivate both of these with engaging with society. In the future, this will entail that physical and digital learning and research environment, environments must be designed in a holistic uh, way to accommodate the different needs of a diverse university community and allow for flexible and blended approaches. The physical campus will continue to be crucial as a place for social interaction and dialogue, but will also offer quite spaces for focused learning and research. The virtual campus will make the university ubiquitous. It will be developed to improve access for all to participate in research and learning, enhance cooperation, and explore new innovation ways of pursuing university missions. But let us come back to the lecture series. It is named after Kurt Gödel, a famous logician, mathematician, and philosopher. Born about 50 kilometers to the east of Vienna in Brno, Kurt Gödel studied theoretical physics, philosophy, and number theory at University Vienna. 
He was member of the Vienna Circle, a group of philosophers and scientists drawn from the natural and social sciences, logic and mathematics. It appeared in public with the publication of various book series, for example, Schriften zur wissenschaftlichen Weltauffassung, as well as Einheitswissenschaft and the journal Erkenntnis, and of course, the organization of international conferences. The Vienna Circle's influence on the 20th century philosophy, especially philosophy of science and analytic philosophy, is immense up to the present day. This year's third lecture will show us in a very impressive way. Dear Professor Wadi, we are all looking for your lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, now it's uh, my pleasure and great honor to introduce Professor Moshe Wadi. Moshe is a George Distinguished Service Professor at Rice University in Texas. Uh, prior to joining Rice, he was at IBM Almaden um, and uh, he got his PhD from the University of Jerusalem, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in 1981. And he published more than 600 papers, published several books, edited volumes. Moshe has made significant contributions to many areas of computer science, including automated reasoning, probabilistic reasoning, database theory, computational complexity theory, multi-agent systems, computer-aided design, and verification. So when browsing through all his papers, uh, one gets the impression that there must be several Moshe Vadis because a single person cannot accomplish that much. And in addition to his scientific work, he provides an incredible service to the computer science community in, in many ways. So for instance, he initiated um, and chairs the Federated Logic Conference, short block, which takes place every four years. And it's a large conference which help to build bridges between various sub-communities of computer scientists working in different areas in this uh, connection between uh, computer science and logic. And in 2014, the Federated Logic Conference was part of the Summer of Logic here in Vienna, and we had the, the pleasure of hosting Flock. Uh, with his public talks and his editorials in the communications of the ACM, he steadily addresses important topics, including questions related uh, to the interaction between computer science and society. He always provides extremely valuable insight and food for thought. He always provides now Moshe is the recipient of numerous awards, so that makes it easy for me because I can just now say the there are too many of them, so I can't so uh, list them all. Um, maybe to, to mention just two that are kind of linked to this lecture series. In 2000, Moshe received the, the Gödel Prize, and just recently um, he received the Knut Prize. Now. Um, by induction, one could now predict that um, in uh, 2029, uh, um, the speaker of the Gödel lecture might be a recipient of the Wadi Prize, which I think doesn't exist yet, but who knows? So um, before I, I give the floor to Moshe, uh, just two quick announcements. So so after the talk, uh, I, I there will be a question answering session with Moshe. And when you join via Zoom, please use the Q&A button on your client. There you can propose questions, but you can also upvote questions proposed by others. So you can already start posing some questions during the talk so that after uh, the talk, we are ready to go with uh, hopefully a list of interesting questions. And the other thing is, please um, keep around after the questions, because then 
Um, our Dean of the Faculty of Informatics, Professor Gerd Kappel, will uh, close with some concluding remarks and she will also um, emphasize and explain the many different ties uh, that exist between Moshe and the UBU. But now, without further ado, um, please enjoy Moshe's talk. Thank you all. Can you hear me? Stefan? Thank you all. Can you hear me? Stefan? Can you can hear you? Uh, yes, Moshe. You. Okay, wonderful. We can hear you, Moshe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear you? Yes. So Moshe. it is my great pleasure to give the Geda lecture. It is humbling to give a, a Geda lecture and someone that, is my great that Professor Don McNuth was the first speaker in this series. So this is a amazing. We are following the footstep, really standing on the footstep of on the on the shoulders of giants here. Uh, excuse me, Moshe. Can you go yes. into the presentation mode because then it's easier ah. to. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. Better. Okay. Yeah. So, as the rector already made it clear in her introductory comments, technology is driving the future. We're all realizing we're living through a time of fast technological change that drives societal change. And the question I really want to address is who is doing the steering? Who is controlling these forces? And, and I will relate I really it to the Vienna to Circle, Wienkreis, and the Digital Humanism Initiative that was launched here in Vienna a few years ago. Uh, in, in November, of last year, November 8th, just two, two days after the election, Yanis Varoufakis, who used to be the Treasury Secretary in, in, in Greece, published an article in The Guardian. And he wrote that this content that swept Trump to power in 2016 has not gone away. To pretend like it has only invite future disaster. This was November 8th. And and Varoufakis was already predicting that, is, that we are not done with Trump just because Trump lost the election. And indeed, in, in uh, January 6 of this year, we witnessed the Capitol insurrection. And it was the scariest day that I have lived through in the United States. It was scarier than 9-11. 9-11, as, as horrible as it was, I never felt that the U.S. is is going through an existential threat. January 6th, when you think of U.S. democracy, it felt as if the U, there is existential threat to, to U.S. democracy. So, what is going on? What is how did what what has changed that suddenly we are facing? If I if I ask you what could be happening in Capitol, it would be inconceivable that something like that would happen would have happened. And I want to inject the issue of trust. Why, and I'll, we will see why trust is such an important concept here. So trust is defined as reliance on integrity, strength, or ability, surety, etc., of a person or a thing. Trust is defined as and we kind of go around in life not really enough thinking about the role of trust. But even very often, a corporation have an off-site retreat and for team building, and they have and they have people play what's called a trustful game, and you see it in a picture. And what you have to do in a trustful game, you have to fall backwards from a platform, and your colleagues are standing behind you, and they will catch you. But you do not see them. You have to believe that they are there, and you have to believe that they will, they will catch you, and you will not be held. And this is about trust. So it's about building trust in teams. George Schultz used to be U.S. Secretary, Sec uh, uh, Secretary of State, just passed away in February. And in December, he was 100 years old. And he published an op-ed on, on, the, on December 20th. And he writes, December 13 marks my turning 100 years young. I'm struck that there is one lesson I learned early. Trust is the coin of the realm. So societies are built on early. trust. trust now, why is trust so important? And this is the first connection I will make here to the Vienna Circle, and I will quote Ludwig Wittgenstein. He was not a member of the inner circle, the people who used to meet regularly, 
but he was a member of the outer Vienna circle, someone who interacted with people in the Vienna circle, had an influence on the Vienna circle. And one of the most profound thing that Wittgenstein said was every game must have an un one unwritten rule. And what is the unwritten rule? Follow the rules of the game. And you cannot write it down because as soon as you write it down, you need another unwritten rule that would say, follow that rule. Now in game theory, it is common to say the rules of the game are common knowledge among the players, but it's not enough. The player must trust that say, other players the follow the, the rules. Common knowledge among so the in players. every game, we must common. trust that players follow the rules. One example, traffic lights. So when I reach a, a, a traffic light and it is green, I drive through without hesitation because I trust that the lights are working properly. So the other direction will have red light and I trust that the other driver will stop at the, at the red light. But I talked to friends once from Egypt and he, he told me, oh, a red light is a friendly suggestion. So I said, what happened when you go to a green light? He said, oh, you slow down to see whether the other side is obeying the lights. And democracy is another game. The Washington Post wrote in, in last November, if the losing party won't accept defeat, democracy is dead. And this is one of the crises that we are living to United States right now, with the other side not clearly accepting the rules, deciding, accepting to follow the rule when you lose. You must accept the rule not only when you win, but also when you lose. Trust has a huge social value, both economic and political. Martin Sandro wrote a, a few years ago in the Financial Times, said economists study the role of trust in economics. And they show that, for example, that low trust countries, example are Russia, Mexico, Yugoslavia, compared to even the UK, compared to Sweden. Sweden is an example of a high trust country. And you see, for example, that, that Russia lose almost 70% of income can, per capita because of lack of trust. Because if there is no trust in an economy, it creates more friction on every transaction. On every transaction, that require the two sides to follow the rules. If you don't trust and follow the rule, there is, there is extra friction that is caused by that. David Brooks wrote last October, levels of trust in this country, in our institutions, in our politics, in one another, are in precipitous decline. And when social trust collapse, nations fail. Can we get it back before it is too late? Now, I will focus more on technology here. So I claim that in particular, we have crisis of trust in technology because to trust technology, either you are familiar with it or you're fam familiar with the people who develop the technology or you trust the company, or you trust the industry. What happens if it's none of the above? You don't understand the technology, the black box, you don't know the people, you don't trust the company, you, know, you trust Facebook and you don't even maybe even trust the computer industry. What if it's none of the above? So let's take a look, for example, at computer security. Think about it. Every day now we hear about attacks. The most recent one with the ransomware attack on the colonial pipeline. A pipeline was shut the most recent one by a ransomware attack. attack. The Washington Post wrote last December that global losses from cybercrime are close to, they were close to a trillion dollar in 2020. American democracy has been hacked. I'll come back to it. I would say I'm a computing professional. I'm not a security researcher per se, but cybersecurity is a failure of the computing profession. We should all stand embarrassed by what we have done. Privacy, there's no privacy. Surveillance is a feature, it's not a bug. I'll mention another example. I talked at length, automated decision-making. You may hear a lot about explainable AI. The explainable AI right now is a term of aspiration. There's no explainable AI. I mean, it's a nice research area, but already we have automated decision-making deployed in our life in a completely opaque way. And I'll talk about that at length. Do we trust technology vendors? M Microsoft just sent me an update to their service policy. Did I read it? Of course not, it's 15,000 words. I cannot read Microsoft it. Microsoft just sent me an update. The industry is self-serving. They have developed surveillance as a business model. And I'll talk about that at length. And the hypocrisy is going. So tech executives brag that they don't, they don't allow screen, screens in their own home for their own children. So they are developing this technology, but for your children, not for their children. And 
you know, in my neighborhood, I see self-driving cars driving around. But in Silicon Valley, there are, there are many neighborhoods where do, they do not want to have uh, um, self-driving cars in their neighborhood. Mark Benioff, or CEO of Salesforce, wrote, there is a crisis of trust concerning data privacy and cybersecurity, and I think it's much, deep, it's much deeper than that. And that has led to the so-called the tech clash, which is the, the backlash against technology. Peggy Noonan, a well-known columnist in the Watch Journal, wrote in 2017, and she wrote about gun ownership. And her argument was, was fishy, but she wrote as follows. Because all of their personal and financial information got hacked in the latest breach, because our country's real overloads are in Silicon Valley, and appear to be moral Martians who operate on some weird new postmodern ethical wavelengths, and they will be the ones programming the robots that will soon take all the jobs. So you see, it's a very, very negative attitude about the technology, about the technology industry around Silicon Valley. And this, and there are many, many columns, uh, articles that come out now about the tech clash. And what is, this is 2017. And what's striking about it is here's an article from Foreign Policy Magazine, a, a very respectable policy uh, magazine. The article is from 2000, June 24, 2013. What is, the, what is the headline? Can Silicon Valley save the world? So in 2013, we expect Silicon Valley to save the world. And four years later, we have the tech clash. And in fact, uh, Gizmodo, a tech, a tech uh, uh, magazine, came up with an article, are we living in a tech dystopia? This is another question, are we living in a tech dystopia? And the cartoon shows, uh, on one hand, uh, we were delighted, the progressive were delighted that Facebook and Twitter shut Trump up. And, and so here you see the progressive are, are thinking big tech, but tech Big tech is, is like a big octopus sitting on top of Congress. So are we living in a tech dystopia? And the, the magazine asked several uh, thought leaders and they all basically said, yes, we are already living in a tech dystopia. So let me use one example, machine learning and the justice system. So in April, 2017, the chief justice of the United States, John G. Roberts visited a Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and he was hosted by Shirley Ann Jackson, the president. And they had a fireside chat. And she asked him, can you foresee a day when smart machines driven by, with artificial intelligence says, plural, I don't know why, can you will assist with court and fact finding or even more controversially, the judicial decision making. And John G. Roberts respond, it's a day that's here and it's putting significant strain on how the judiciary goes about doing things. So it says it's already, this technology has already been deployed by the justice system. The New York Times wrote about this, an algorithm that grants freedom or takes it away. And so there are many applications for machine learning in the justice system, bail, sentencing, parole, separating so children from parents. There are growing number of applications where the machine learning is being de already deployed. And there are companies that are out there for business. Here's a company, it's called North Point. They have a beautiful website, Advancing Justice, Embracing Community. Who can be against Advancing Justice and Embracing Community? So this is what the, comp comp the, state, the, the system called Compass. And in 2016, uh, ProPublica, which is a non-for-profit publication, did an audit of Compass. And it showed if you give two identical files, to the system, except in one you make the defendant uh, black, in the other one you make them white. And there are ways you can do that without putting even pictures, names, where they studied, where they grow up, and, white. and, and so you find out that, that, that the compass is already pictures. biased names, against blacks. Where they studied, where they Why is it biased up? against blacks? Because it's machine learning, it's based on the data, and we all know by now, garbage in, garbage out. If the data is biased, because the deep historical bias in the justice system in the United States, which we have learned from the Black Lives Movement. So you learn the bias from the data because the data was biased. Uh, Michelle Alexander, New York Times, called it the new Jim Crow. 
Jim Crow was a system of laws in the South that discriminated against blacks. And, and Michelle Alexander writes, these advanced mathematical models appear colorblind on the surface, but are significantly influenced by pervasive bias in the criminal justice system. Um, you know, there is a, uh, you know, those who, who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. And here in some sense, you can say those who learn from history are doomed to repeat it because of machine learning. So just to show how, how ridiculous things are today with the deployment of machine learning in the justice system, let's talk about my dog, Fluffy. It's a, it's a very, very cute black Labrador. And it's a very well-trained dog. And I trained Fluffy to detect risk very, of very recidivism. Black Labrador. And I took Fluffy to the, to the federal court system in Houston so they can check his accuracy. And Fluffy is uncanny. You take it to, to, to a defendant, and if Fluffy, if the risk of recidivism, Fluffy barks. If there's no risk, Fluffy leaks. That's it, very simple. But as you can see, Fluffy is a black box and does not provide explanation. Would you allow Fluffy to make parole decisions? The answer is, of course not. Everybody understands this is ridiculous. But my claim is, I mean, this is just meant to be a provocative example. My claim is that, the, that machine learning is not very different than Fluffy. In fact, I write, I pass judges all the time. I'm asked to write recommendation letters. Imagine I write a letter, I recommend uh, someone for promotion at TUV, and my letter would be one-liner. I'm recommending recommendation. I'm recommend re recommending promotion. And my letter would be one. People will laugh at the letter. They say it's a useless letter. In fact, they are, they are, I've seen a letter, I think Stanford once asked me for a letter, and he said, don't make a recommendation. Just give an evaluation. We will judge it and make and make decision based on it. But we don't want a recommendation without the explanation. And as, as I said, with, with, with AI, we are very, very far away from explainable, explainable AI. All this uh, view, all this tech clash, very often is explained as a ethics crisis. And here is a sequence of, uh, of uh, headlines from newspaper article tech ethical dark side, computer science space ethics crisis. Now CEO has a new meaning. It's not chief, ex chief executive officer, chief ethics officer. Every company may need chief ethics officer. Facebook is giving money to TU, TU Munich for Institute of Ethics and AI. Ethics, 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 ethics. And I want to be the ethics skeptic. I want to argue that this is ethics is not the right lens through which to look at the current crisis of trust in technology. And let's compare it ourselves, let's compare computing to another technology, transportation technology, automobile. So 1908, about uh, just over 110 years ago, the Ford Model T all of the manufacturing line. And it was not the first automobile, automobile was invented in Europe about 50 years earlier, but Ford industrialized the production. And we got the first mass, cons mass produced and mass consumed Ford automobile. Industrialized the production. So it was a bestseller. And, and mass quickly people realized automobiles, automobiles, people get killed so by automobiles. This is a reality we've been living with and for the last 100 plus years. What did we do? Did we give up technology? No, we were not, it's too convenient. So we were trying to tame the technology for more, more than 100 years. So if you look at mortality by, by uh, what's called motor vehicle death, there are many ways to measure this. In absolute number, we are at the peak. Why? Because there are more people and more automobiles. So transportation experts measure it, mortalities or deaths per billion VMT, vehicles, miles traveled. And this is the red line that you see here. And you can see that we used to be in the early, in, in early 20th century, close to 250 lives or death per billion mile travel. And now we are at about maybe 10. So we had a, 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 an improvement of like a 25x. We made great improvement. This is really, we made it, it's very, very good news. How did we do it? Not by one measure, by a plethora of different measures. Mirrors, interlock brakes, airbags. We changed the city with crosswalk and traffic lights. And we passed laws like driving while intoxicated. And now we have new laws, driving while texting. 
So we put many, many measures. We continue to put measures. We continue to insist on making cars safer and safer and safer. Have we, have we made cars completely safe? No, but we have made them much safer. Now, what did we say about, for example, driver were intoxicated? We could have said, you know, we will, every driver will, be, will have to take a, an ethics course and we'll tell them driving while intoxicated is unethical. No, we didn't do it. We said it's illegal. You're going to go to jail if, you, if we catch you. That's how we did it. So we had public policy. If you look at all of these measures, it's public policy. Partly it was done by the market. Partly it was done by regulation, like airbags, uh, laws. So it's a whole bunch of different measures that I would put all together under the, under the label public policy. We decided that cars are so convenient, we do not want to give them up but we will, we will enact many, many measures to make them safer. That's public policy. Now I will take the internet as, a, as an example of where we, did, we do not have public policy. So to go to the root of the internet, you have to, and when I talk about internet, I'm not, not just talking about the, 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 the communication infrastructure like TCP IP, I'm talking about the whole ecosystem that we talk about the, the internet, okay? It's a communication and the, the, and the application. This is what we call the internet. So it goes back to the root of the internet, goes back to the culture of the internet, goes back to the well, which was a bulletin board in the Bay Area, California Bay Area in the, in the 80s, very kind of free for all discussion forums. Uh, if you're old enough, you may remember Usenet that we used to have again, this as a, it was a social media, was one of the first social media that I participated in. And if you look at the culturally, what would happen, when you talk about the 60s in the United States, we're really talking about the 70s. We're talking about the, 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 the protest against Vietnam War and the aftermath and the hippie movement. It was very anti-establishment. So the mantra that came out of this counterculture is information wants to be free. It's a mantra, information doesn't want anything, beats don't have any free will, but that's became the mantra, information wants to be free. So when Tim Berners-Lee launched in the late 80s, the World Wide Web, this was his idea, unfettered public sharing of information. And it was, seemed like a wonderful dream. Information should be available, free, everybody should have access. But of course, very quickly after the first few, after the first couple of, of years that was just so exhilarating, we discovered too much information, TMI. How can we find information on the web? So this emerged as a problem in the 90s, how to find information on the web. The first attempt was, well, how do you find books in the library? There is a library catalog. Let's have a, an a catalog and directory for the internet. And this was what, what Yahoo first tried to do. They really, it was incredibly naive. Nobody thought about the scale of the internet with billions of web pages. So they did some directory, some simply did not scale. So another idea emerged, no, 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 directory will be useless. What we need are good search engines. But the first one were really bad. You did a search on one thing, you got something else. It was very difficult to get good search result until Google came up with a fantastic, a, a good, fantastically good search engine. I mean, it was very often the first thing, I got lucky. The first link is what you need. You don't need to go beyond that. And nobody ever goes beyond the first page of a, of a web search because the good stuff is always on the first page. Now, Google was operating under the mantra, information wants to be free. So how do they make money? They need to make money. They need to monetize free information. And they came up with a brilliant business solution. Let's use, you know, how do newspaper, newspaper are not free, but they're they are greatly subsidized. TV, broad, broadcast TV used to be free. Advertising, it was a great, a great uh, idea. Now they quickly discovered that online advertising is very ineffective. So if you have a newspaper and you really want to catch someone's eye, you put a big banner, you pay for the real estate on the page. Um, people tried to put banner edges on, on the web, but the users hated it. So Google came up with another brilliant idea, micro-targeted advertising. When I do, uh, when I open a, a, a newspaper uh, and I see some advertisements on, online, and when you do it, we see something different because it is based on my specific history. It makes what they think is my preference. They want to maximize what they call click through. They want me to click on the ad. For that, they need personal data about me. They need lots of personal data. In fact, we have no idea how much personal data they have. We think that they're monitoring us online, but it was a leak a couple of years ago that Google buys the data from MasterCard. They want to find out 
everything I buy, online or offline. They want to know everything about me that they could, so they can target the information perfectly, 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 perfectly for me. I mean, just to give an example, uh, I did a search on one thing on my wife's laptop. And a couple of days later, I see advertisements for it on my Facebook wall. I was logging in as her. I was doing the searches on her computer. Within two days, it's on my Facebook wall. That was, that was just uncanny. It was disturbing. This has been named in a book that came up in 2019. It's a massive book by Shoshana Zubov from Harvard, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. The, the explanation in a, the, the way they said in Silicon Valley, if you're not paying for it, you are the product. After the capital insurrection, Shoshana, Shoshana Zuboff wrote an op-ed in New York Times. It was headlined, the coup we are not talking about. And she wrote, we can have democracy or we can have surveillance society, but we cannot have both. Because she argued that we live today in information civilization and knowledge is power. And the tech company knows all about us, but how they do their business, who they take, who they get data from and who they sell it to, we have no idea. And so they have the power. And that's why he said the coup we are not talking about. How well has it, this worked for Google? This has worked fantastically well for Google. Google today is a huge company, Google and Alphabet. They're making close to $150 billion in advertising. So this was one of the greatest business idea of all time. There's no question about it. So imagine now that we're going to, to, to take Sergey Brin and Larry Page, who are the founders of Google. So imagine and we're going to send them to an ethics bootcamp, maybe at, 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 at Technical University of Munich, where they have Institute of Ethics and AI. Do we think they're going to come back and tell Google, oh, this was all one big mistake. Let's stop the advertising business. There's $150 million there. They are not going to give it up. Any talk about ethics in this context is completely naive. I wrote about two years ago, I wrote, if society finds surveillance business model offensive, then the remedy is public policy in the forms of laws and regulation rather than ethics outrage. The industry would love to, to talk to us about, about ethics because as long as we talk about ethics, we don't talk about laws and regulation. Now, people are saying, wait a minute, but I get free, I get all this stuff from Google for free. I use Gmail, it's free. I use Google search, it's free. Really? You think it's really free? Google make almost 150 billion for advertisements. Who pays for it? Well, the answer is, you said, not me, the advertisers pay for it. Where do the advertisers get the money? They pass it on to the consumers. So the money that Google had is ultimately coming from consumer, but in a totally opaque way. So we got mass surveillance, we got this invisible task, tax. Everything you do, everything you buy has an invisible tax. I don't know exactly to compute what the percentage, but there's every transaction that you buy today, there is a tax somewhere and it goes to Google and Facebook. Now, it's actually in some sense even worse. So we think that people are doing this transaction willingly. So, okay, I'm getting free stuff. I'm giving my data. It's a fair transaction. But it turns out that very few people actually know the extent of surveillance capitalism. For example, uh, Facebook maintains a very, very detailed profile of every user. And you can actually, if you click, if you click through the menu of advertising and preferences, eventually you find your profile. But the vast majority of people have no idea that Facebook maintains such a detailed profile. More than 50% when, when they are shown this profile, they are uncomfortable and they even disagree with, the, with this profile. So, you know, I bet here that in this audience, I bet that 95% of the people use uh, Gmail and I bet that 95% never read the terms of services and they have no, and this is a sophisticated audience here. And I bet that 95% never read the terms and they have no idea what they've agreed, what they agreed. And if you have to, I encourage you to read it and you'll be surprised how much you're given a uh, Google. Every time you send a paper by Gmail, you're given a, a Google a right to use this, the, tech, the content to improve their services, whatever that means. Now I want to change and talk about another era in technology where I think, again, I want to show you that the issue is public policy and not ethics. So here is a copy 
a copy, uh, the first paragraph of a license that, <clears throat> again, you just have to click through and you see the license you obtain when you're using various devices. So I don't only want to mention the company, let's call the company XXX, but the, the main thing is the company says, we are not liable to the extent not prohibited by applicable law, and there is almost no such law, in no event shall XXX be liable for personal injury or any incidental, special and indirect consequential damages whatsoever. So the answer is, use this technology at your own risk. This is the standard term on all computing technology. Use it at your own risk. We are not liable. Now it's important to understand that this is such a gross exception. So I have a car. Uh, let's suppose that I drive the car and the tire is, is, uh, is full with air and it's a, not a, it's a fairly new tire. Let's suppose the tire blows up and I have an accident. Who's responsible? Well, the tire manufacturer is responsible. This is called strict liability. Now this is a legal doctrine emerged over the 20th century because people discovered that the earlier doctrine of caveat emptor, buyer beware, cannot be applied in technological society. There's no way you can take, you buy things and you ch check how sound is the product. So we put all the liability on the manufacturer and this is called strict liability and it apply mostly to product liability. So most, when you buy a blender today, they're liable, whether they're negligent or not, they're different degrees of liability, but they're always liable for product, for all the product. The one exception is computing products. The notion of strict liability goes, it's very old, it's 4,000 years old. It goes, the, it goes back to the laws of Hammurabi in, in Mesopotamia. I love this paragraph. If a builder has built a house for a man, and has not made his work sound, and the house which he has built has fallen down and so caused the death of the householder, that builder shall be put to death. This is strict liability, okay? So maybe we don't do this today, but there is strict liability on for house builders. There's no liability whatsoever for computing equipment or software, hardware. And this has been pointed out by a philosopher, Helen Nissenbaum, 25 years ago. And she wrote an essay, an article, Accountability in Computerized Society. And she said, this essay warns of eroding accountability in computerized societies. It argues that assumptions about computing and feature of situation in which computers are produced create barrier to accountability. And she said, we need to change policies, explicit standard of care, strict the producer liability, and so on and so forth. Again, is it, is it, can we say that these companies are unethical? No. They have found a loophole is it, is it that computer see? products somehow fall between, between, between the cracks of product liability laws and they're using it. If we want to change it, it's, up, it's on us. It's a lack of public policy. It's not an issue of ethics, I claim. Now, why is there no, there is such a poverty of IT public policy? The tech companies today, if you look at the five big companies, Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, they are immensely powerful. They're more than $10 trillion in market capitalization. They are, you know, if you look at the standard, the, the biggest 500 companies in the United States, the tech companies are more than 25% of the standard pool 500. And the tech industry, the current one in the previous generation, always lobbied against regulation. It was always regulation stifles innovation. Don't regulate us. You're going to kill the, 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 the goose that, lies, that, that lays the golden eggs. Just uh, uh, in, in 2018, the Security and Exchange Commission investigated Elon Musk for tweeting that they thought was trying to manipulate the stock price. And Wired Magazine, a tech magazine, hyperventilated. The case against Elon Musk will chill innovation. God forbid we should let Elon Musk get away with anything he wants, just in a, all in the name of innovation. But, but this culture is, goes deeper. It's not just the industry. So in 1996, in, uh, 25 years ago, John Perry Barlow and a bunch of other people uh, created the Electronic Frontier Foundation. This is where the internet was just coming to, to the front, mid, mid 90s, the commercial internet was just emerging. And, and it's really, you should all read this Declaration of Independence of Cyprus Fest because the naivety is just unbelievable. Governments of the industrial world, you were a giant of flesh and steel. I come from cyberspace, the new home of the mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. Somehow the philosophy of what happened in cyberspace will stay in cyberspace. But of course, we know that this is not the case. 
we know that it, that, that after, especially after we saw what happened in the Colina pipeline, in a, an attack on the US power grid is feasible and possible. In fact, there was an investigation showed that, that Russia has been trying to penetrate the US power grid. What about the election, US election system? I'll come back to it in a few minutes. Can you attack the US election system? In another part of the tech culture, especially in Silicon Valley, is the disruption culture. So in 1995, Clayton Christensen, a very influential uh, business professor from Harvard who passed away fairly recently, uh, coined the very, very famous phrase, disruptive innovation. And he showed that basically every new wave of technology disrupt the previous one. In fact, his demonstration was about this drive technology. This drive used to be yeah big and they got smaller and smaller and smaller every time a new technology and every time a new technology disrupted an established uh, uh, producer. He was just trying to be descriptive. But Silicon Valley took it as a, as, as a prescriptive and every business plan start, we're going to disrupt this, we're going to disrupt that. Uh, in an article in New York Times from last October, uh, Hefferman wrote, ennobling destruction and sabotage make the most brutal form of capitalism seems like God's will. And Facebook took it to heart and their motto until 2014, then the, for PR relation, Facebook they dropped it, it but it very much the way they operate, move fast and break, and break things was their motto. Don't just disrupt, break it. Unless you're breaking stuff, you're not moving fast enough. And now we know that Facebook basic model of frictionless sharing is a terrible idea. It enables massive dissemination of fake news. The, now we know that the US, the 2016 US election was hacked by Russia. Now, it doesn't mean that they hacked the voting machines. They hacked the most a, a, a fragile part of the election system, which are people by massive dissemination of information. This was uh, first, the case was first made compellingly by Kathleen Jamison in a 2018 book, but all the investigation that came up later by even by the US, uh, by the US Senate established that Russia did have the, the 2016 election. The only thing over which there's still debate is to what extent there was collusion, collusion by, the, by the Trump campaign with Russia. This is still maybe a matter of debate, but the fact that Russia did manage to have decided impact on the election, that's beyond doubt now. And I'll use a, the final example I want to use, a, what I call criminality as a business model. This is a phrase by, I got from some column, uh, in some, some log, and what is that? Yeah, look, we call it, we have the sharing economy. What is the sharing economy? Sharing economy is people will drive you for money. People will rent your house to you for money. But most city regulate, for example, if, if, a, if, if a few years ago, before Uber and Lyft, if I want to start driving people for money, I need a taxi medallion, I need a taxi license. I cannot just drive people for money because most city says that who drives in our, in our streets for, for, for business is an important uh, uh, municipal issue and we're going to regulate it and issue licenses. Similarly, uh, if I want to start uh, in in uh, the area where I live, I'm not allowed, I'm allowed to rent my house, but I'm not allowed to rent my house every night. I'm not allowed to turn my house into a hotel. But that's exactly what Airbnb does. So both Airbnb and Uber and Lyft, all of them are based on the business model is break the law. Now they can say, oh, we are not breaking the law. We're just a platform. We're just connecting uh, uh, buyers and sellers. But imagine that somebody created an app for illegal drug delivery. So right now let's say heroin is Ill, Ill, illegal in Houston. And imagine that in Texas, and imagine that I have an app that connect buyer and seller. Of course, I will, be, I will be criminally liable because I'm enabling a crime. So these companies are all in the business of enabling, breaking the law. Of course, they, pro they provide fantastic services and politically it's very, very difficult to go after them. So they have, turn, they have turned criminality into a business model. So again, is it ethics or, or public policy? Now there's a lot of talk about corporate responsibility. A corporate responsibility is a term that goes, back, goes back more than 50 years. If you go back to the, to the 60s, companies start talking about social responsibility. And you ask a CEO in 1960, whom are you responsible to? 
the CEO would say, I have many, have many stakeholders, stakeholders they call it. I have shareholders, I have customer, I have employees, there is a community, the board, I have many stakeholders. I'm trying to navigate the good of all of my stakeholders. But in the 1980s, a new dogma came to the fore and the dogma was shareholder primacy. And this follows after Milton Friedman, who wrote a very influential article in 1970, the social responsibility of business is to increase its profit. Nothing else counts. And this has been so bad, the results have been so bad that even the business roundtable two years ago decided to say, no, 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 we need to go back to stakeholder responsibility. So now allegedly or supposedly CEOs will try to balance the interest of all of their stakeholders. So, but you see, we're still leaving it to corporation to decide. So if you go back to my question from the beginning, technology is driving the future. Who's doing the steering? The answer is tech corporations are doing the steering. Why? Because technology has moved very, very fast and public policy has lagged way behind. And to go back to, to regulation which stifle innovation, innovation should never be the goal. Innovation is means for societal progress. And we need to go back and talk about putting societal progress at the, at the top of our priority. In fact, TUV, and I believe that the motto is technology for people. The goal is not technology, the goal, are, the goal is societal progress. Uh, Benjamin Applebaum wrote, I think, an important article in the New York Times last year. And again, he said, let's stop blaming Milton Friedman. And let's stop hoping that corporations will, will rescue us by becoming more responsible. He said, critics have been fighting ever since to get the corporation to acknowledge the broader responsibility. It's the wrong battle, he says. Instead of redefining the role of corporation, we need to redefine the role of the state. And of course, nobody likes the government. But he said, the governments remain the most powerful means to express our collective will. The necessary solution is to create stronger incentive for good behavior and laws against bad behavior. You look at the US Constitution. What is the purpose of Constitution? To enable a more perfect union, to enable societal progress. This is the role of government. Now I want to go back to ethics because I kind of said not ethic, not ethic, not ethics. Am I saying that ethic is not important? Of course not. Ethic is very important. And I, I teach a, a course on computing ethics in society. And my, my co-instructor Rodrigo Ferrer and I published an article in 60 earlier this year, which is available on my webpage. And I, I would love people to read it and comment on it. So ethics is very important. In fact, Chief Justice Earl Warren in 1960 says in civilized life, the law floats in a sea of ethics. I love it. The law floats in a sea of ethics. And of course, we all know that finding the, 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 the balance between ethics and policies can be very tricky. So in the United States, uh, people in the early, in the, in the first part of the 20th century decided that getting drunk, that alcoholism is a big societal menace. So we had prohibition. It was terrible. The consequence was terrible. In more recent time, we had a drug war the consequences were horrific. So we now understand that deciding what to leave to personal decision and what to leave to society is a very tricky business. But bottom line is ethics is about individual responsibility. Public policy about societal responsibility. The law is institutional, ethics is not. There are only, to the best of my knowledge, there are two areas, the law in, in, the, law, in the law profession, in the medical profession, ethics is the power of law. If I'm a doctor and I violate eth ethical violation, I can lose my license. They have institutional ethics. But if I'm an unethical programmer and I start a company like, like let's say Facebook, ethics has nothing to do with it. There's nothing, you can complain that, that uh, Mark Zuckerberg is unethical, but there's no way to, to act on it. It's not ac actionable. Now there is a wide recognition that regulation is coming. And here is a quote. And all of them are from industry CEOs who believe it's time to have regulation. And actually their interest is, it, is again, it's a bit self-serving. They want to make sure that they're all on the same, on the same, the regulation apply to all of them equally. They're worried about if they act responsib responsibly, another company doesn't, they are at the business disadvantage. So the, so the regulation will establish uh, kind of, they'll put all of these companies on equal footing. And uh, of course, there is some tension between them, 
uh, Apple can advocate for privacy because the business model is selling you iPhones. So they can go, you go in the Bay Area and you see huge billboards. What happens on your iPhone stays on your iPhone. And so there is a war right now between Apple and Facebook on the issue of privacy, for example. So uh, again, the interesting thing, the shift, Paul Romer is a, an economist, very well-known economist. The economist, is, his claim to fame is the, the, the economy of innovation. Uh, he was at Stanford. He moved to, to uh, New York, to NYU, and he got the Nobel Prize in 2018. And the New York Times just in an article how he changed his mind. He basically said he changed his mind and he's now become a fierce critic of the tech industry. And he's saying, leaving it all to the market is just so wrong. And he said, for example, we need to put taxes on digital ads because it's the only way we're con going to control them. They have found the loopholes in our economic system and we need to have specific taxes for digital advertising. The real question is how to regulate. And this is tough. How to regulate is hard. Good regulation is hard. It's not, you know, it's, a, it's that's why the constitution says a more perfect union. It's not a perfect union. It's a more perfect union. For example, I gave this talk in a, in a conference in, uh, in Romania. And uh, the Romanian says, more regulation is just more invitation to more bribes, more bribery. And uh, they, they could be right. So if you don't have good governance, regulation is, is really just an invitation to corruption. And there is a debate, for example, you find, you find different approaches between the US, which focus on technology, Europe focus more on societal impact. And clearly in some areas such as, uh, such as uh, cyber insecurity and ransomware, we'll have to have international treaty, just like piracy. And a huge question that looms over this whole thing is big tech too big? Do we need to apply antitrust law? And Tim Wu wrote an article in the, in the New York Times in 2018 be afraid of economic bigness, be very afraid. And he argued that we need to break up big tech. And now he's serving the Trump administration. So we will see what happens with that. I think, for example, Facebook should never been allowed to buy Instagram and WhatsApp. One day they go, they, the tech industry companies, tech companies go is by buying their competition. And this needs to be again controlled. And maybe now we should tell Facebook to spin off Instagram and WhatsApp. Now here are some example of easy policy suggestion. I think these are the easy ones, okay? Uh, you know, you're not going to, you don't, you're not reading the, the, the terms of services of Microsoft and Google because it's just way too long. We need to have, there is something called in the investment, investment industry, there's, there's something called plain language requirement. When, when I buy a mutual fund, I get, again, a, a, I get a big uh, prospectus, but it must include one paragraph in a simple language that, in, that explain what is, the, what, is this, what is the essence of this investment? We need a plain language requirement for every, every uh, license that you, that you agree. Uh, New York Times wrote about it, fix the fine print. What we saw before is that the Chief Justice of the United States feels helpless in view of automated decision system. The Chief Justice of the United States is the chief regulator of the federal court system. And it's time to regulate automated decision system. And Jim Larus and Chris, and Chris Hunking wrote a very nice column about it in the CSCM about, about three years ago, how to regulate automated decision systems. Um, again, that easy, easy thing to, to say, you, we need to give users a choice. Now, finally, for example, Apple has given people on, on, on Apple product a choice. Do they want Facebook the ability to track them or not? Of course, Apple is, uh, Facebook is mad about it, but Apple decided to give them a choice. But this should be required by law. It should be a decision by Apple to give consumer a choice. But it should be, a, 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 again, it should be rule and laws and regulation, public policy. Uh, when Yahoo was bought by AT&T, they told us that the billion and a half users' data was compromised a year earlier. It's only because they were being bought by, by AT&T, they had to disclose it. So we should require company to disclose, crit especially critical company, to disclose every time they are breached and hacked. Now, the biggest, I think the most, the most difficult uh, uh, public policy question is how to reg regulate speech on the internet. And I call it the social trial lemma. And it was essentially put very nicely by Emily Bazelon in the New York Times in January. Why is big tech policing speech? Because the government isn't. And she writes, 
were uncomfortable with government doing it, were uncomfortable with Silicon Valley doing it, we're also uncomfortable with nobody doing it at all. Do we want bad speech and hateful speech and terror, pro-terrorism, pro-Nazi speech to be all over, all over social media? We don't want it either. So we seem to be stuck. And I want to go back to the, to the Vienna circle where we started. So Carl Sigmund wrote a, a beautiful book about the, the Vienna circle, Wien Kreis, and he came out in the United States in 2017. And the headline was slightly different than it was in German. And it was just a brilliant headline, the brilliant title, Exact Thinking in Demented Times, just beautiful. And just you have to remember, it was came in 2017. Trump was just, just became president. So it was really felt like demented times. And it's a book about the group, a dazzling group biography of the early 20th century thinker who transformed the way the world thought about math and science. And of course, the most famous and the most influential member of the, of the Vienna Circle was Kurt Friedrich Gedel, who as a child was known as Der Herr Warum, because as a, as a child, he was intensely curious and he could never be satisfied with any explanation. Whatever you explain to him, he would ask, but why? Warum, warum, warum? So his nickname was Der Herr Warum. And he's mostly famous for incompleteness theorem where on September 7, 1930, in a conference on the epistemology of direct sciences in Königsberg in a panel discussion, he made a statement that seemed cryptic at the time. And later he published the paper, it became clear how profound it was. He, he said, one may in fact exhibit sentences, which although intentionally correct, it's a weird phrase, but it really means true, are not provable in any formal system of mathematics. And the Gedelian sentence is, I am not provable. And Gedel show how you can write a formal sentence in logic that would say, I'm not provable. Of course, it's an example of self-reference. Self and you can see that if you, if this sentence cannot be proved, because if it if you prove it, then you have a contradiction. So you cannot you cannot prove this sentence. It is true, but not provable. Now I want to jump to another philosopher, again, who was on the outer circle of the Vienna circuit. And this is Karl Raymond Popper, who is famous for the Popper principle in, in a, on the philosophy of science, but he was also a, a staunch defender of liberal, of liberal democracy. And the book that he wrote in, the, in 1945, The Open, Open Society and Its Enemies, is really a very, very important book of political philosophy. And Popper was inspired by Gödel. And you, what he learned from Gödel was too much truth leads to contradiction. Because if you have too much truth, you can say, I'm, no, I'm false, and you get a contradiction. And he showed that this idea of too much of a good thing create problems is also relevant to democracies. And the three Popperian paradoxes are, one, if you have unlimited tolerance, it leads to this disappearance of tolerance because you tolerate the intolerant. And you have total freedom, it leads to the suppression of the weak by the strong. And democracy has its own, is its own contradiction because the majority can choose tyranny, and which is exactly, in fact, what happened in, in Germany in the early 30s. The majority chose tyranny. And my version of the proper paradox is the paradox of speech, I would call it too much speech lead to the curtailment of speech. The philosophy in the United States is that he said, the solution to problematic speech is more speech, more, more, and better. I think that's, I think they got it wrong. I think that with as a society, especially when it comes to, to, to speech on social media, we'll have to figure out what is, what is the, the, how do you have a more perfect social media, not a perfect one. And unlimited speech in this case would lead to curtailments of speech. So I want to uh, reach to, to closing. I want to quote two of the, the patron saints, so to speak, of computing. One was Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, who wrote about the, the uh, uh, calculus ratio sinet, or reasoning calculus, who he philosophized the idea of a, of a computer. And he will say, mankind will then possess a new instrument that will enhance the capabilities of the mind to a far greater extent than optical instrument strength in the eyes. So the goal of, comp of computing is to enhance 
the capabilities of their mind. And we need to remember that. This is the goal. The goal is technology for people. Ada Lovelace, in correspondence with Charles Babbage, where he wanted to make money of the analytical engine, she wrote, I wish to add my mind towards expounding, interpreting the Almighty and his laws and works for the most effective use of mankind. He said, he wrote, she wrote in the letter, it's okay for me that you want to make money, but I want to put this technology for the most effective use of mankind, technology for social good. That should be, I believe, our slogan. And I want to tell you, just close by telling you about an initiative that was started in Vienna a couple of years ago and uh, led by people from Vienna and other people who are involved. We issue a Vienna Manifest on Digital Humanism in May of 2019, so just about uh, two years ago. We must shape technology in accordance with human values and needs. Instead of allowing technology to shape humans, our task is not only to rein in the downsides of information communication technology, but to encourage human-centered innovation. And I encourage you to, to not only look at the manifesto, which you can find on the web, but also go ahead and, and do a web search for Digital Humanism Initiative, where there are ongoing activities where we are trying to flesh out. And I want to finish by, by quoting a company. The company is BMW. And BMW, their motto for many years used to be BMW, the ultimate driving machine. And now by, by they're being threatened by autonomous vehicles. So the new slogan is, don't be driven by technology, drive it. And I think this, this uh, motto is also appropriate for technology. We should not be driven by technology, we should drive it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Moshe, very, very interesting talk. So uh, we received quite some questions on the Q&A uh, part of Zoom. So please, um, if you join via Zoom, please maybe post a few more questions and maybe if more importantly, uh, look through the questions and upvote those that you are uh, interested in most. But we also have here a small number of uh, participants here physically. So if anybody of you want to post a question, um, we uh, are happy to include that. And I already saw two hands. Uh, maybe uh, Stefan Wolfram, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for this excellent talk, Moshe, in particular for making so explicit the difference between this ethics washing and public measurement. And my question goes into this uh, public measures, how to do this. Now, I mean, the European Union is now in, in designing a, an AI regulation. And I mean, I don't want to ask you about this particular regulation, but my question goes back uh, one step when the EU, EU uh, launched the GPTR, the data projection regulation. And my question is, how was this received say, in the US first? How was then the impact and how is it received nowadays? And I find a remark from my side, I never used Gmail accounts, so your 95% estimation at least is not an underestimation here in this room. Thank you. Um, so yeah, the questions about the European attempt to regulation is a very good one because it gets tied, unfortunately in this case, it gets into the politics, okay? Which is in here you have the EU, all the technology, by and large, I wouldn't say all, but by and large, these technologies by US companies, US based companies. And now you have the EU trying to regulate uh, US companies. So you can see immediately this creates tension because the, you know, it creates, in some sense, immediate kind of resistance in the United States. Why are you trying to regulate, to regulate us? Of course, technology is now international, you know, the technology is used everywhere. Uh, Europe can force changes because it's a large economy. The EU altogether is a very large economy. It's, I don't know exactly the numbers, but it kind of close in size, I think, to the size of the US, somewhere around $20 trillion a year uh, GDP, combined GDP. Uh, I think I think that, uh, again, I want to, to record the, the, the US constitution when you come to this regulation. The goal is to form a more perfect union. In fact, if you look at the constitution, the, the issues of the Bill of Rights that we have in the Constitution, these are all amendments. 
you know, people forget that these are the, the first ten amendments. All what we, we very often we talk about the constitution. They're not. It's not in the the first constitution. They say, wait a minute, we missed the issues of of enumerating rights. Let's go back and have amendments to enumerate rights. Um, example, when you don't treat it as an as, as experiment, is what happened with what's called the United States Obamacare. So President Obama passed this uh, this uh, health insurance, built the health insurance system in the United States. And uh, it's a huge system. You pass a, a big system, there are going to be bugs in the system. And you need to patch the system. And you need to, to have a version, this was version 0.9 or maybe 0.1, you need version 1.1. But there was no political possibility to amend it because he, he, lost, uh, he lost the first midterm election and they could never amend it. So a system with many, many bugs was deployed without the ability to fix them. So, so Europe should treat all of all of these uh, uh, regulation always as uh, as experiments. You go back, you look at GDPR, and you go two years later. We say, let's evaluate it. What worked? What didn't work? If you look at if you are dealing with any of these regulation is sacrosanct, it's going to be you're going to be bad outcome. Okay, you you should never think that you are done. You should always have version version point nine, version point nine one, nine two, uh, and again more perfect union. So I'm, I'm all in favor of this experiment as long as we should understand that, that uh, the political system produce very imperfect solutions. The goal is always to find more perfect, more perfect uh, regulations. And thank you. Um, interestingly, also on Zoom, I think the top uh, voted question was also uh, related to the, this EU, EU um, AI regulations. Yeah. Um, I would say that G GDPR is, is also controversial in Europe because it see that a lot of what GDPR said, again, it delegated, delegated to the states. And you delegate to the states, you get lots of unevenness. So I've heard the talk by a, a, an EU a attorney, a lawyer, who was very critical of GDPR as a piece of legislation. Okay, it said too many, too many loopholes. So we need to keep improving it. Okay, um, I, I now continue here with uh, the next question, which received quite some um, votes. Um, I paraphrase it a bit because it's a long question. I think it has two parts. The first part is why there should be um, a hard dichotomy uh, between ethics and regulations, why not both? And in the second part, I think there is also this question what's the ethical responsibility by uh, technicians, computer scientists who work in industry, um, what is their responsibility and how should they act ethically? So if you say ethic, why ethics or public policy? I said, yes, I said, we need both. Ethics, in, remember the law floats on a sea of ethics. We need to have, we can have ethical discussions, but then if we wanted to, to institutionalize it, we take ethics and we need to decide what should be left to individual decision-making and what should be codified. What part of ethics do we codify in laws and regulation? And that's part of the public policy, what to leave for individual decision-making and what to let the state dictate the terms, okay? That's, that's exactly what public policy is about. But without ethical conversation, we can decide what is good and we have to decide what is good and what is bad before we go and issue laws and regulation. Now the questions about, about the, the individuals was a very good question. So I can tell you a little bit about the, the course that we taught at Rice University. Again, you can find the, the paper on uh, deep tech ethics on my, um, on my webpage. And we basically, the, the key insight that we had in this course are, are I would say two insights. One is that when you look at, at the, if you want, what ethical lens should you look at a technology, the answer was social justice. You look at who is impacted by the economy, by, by technology, who is impacted adversely. And part of a, a big ethical principle, try to define the weakest, the weakest uh, strata of, of society. And, and uh, you know, when you go and, uh, I mean, take for example, Houston has no zoning laws. Zoning uh, regulate where you, what you can build where. Turns out if you go to rich neighborhood, they have a way of, of basically, you know, if somebody tried to build a high rise building in a posh neighborhood in Houston. 
and there's enough money and powerful people there they have dragged in courts now for years. If you go to a poor neighborhood, they'll get away with it. So no zoning, no zoning law serves the rich, but does not serve the poor. So we put social justice at the center of the ethical lens on computing. And the flip side of it is that people have individual responsibility. So I, I should not tell Facebook how to behave on ethics. They should do, they, they, they will run a legal business and we cannot tell them don't do it un unethical, okay? But I can tell my students, um, maybe working in Facebook is not the best choice you can make. Now it's very, it's very tricky, you know, tricky now to make. I will not go so far and tell them to advocate it. I will just say you are responsible for your own action. And we, all of us, are in, as, as individual, are responsible for what's happening in the tech industry. So uh, some people say you're anti-industry. Anti I said, no, I'm in bed with the industry, all of us. We are consulting for the industry. We are sending our students to industry. We get funding from the industry. The Turing Award is funded by Google. You know, the, I would say the computing community, the line, there's no sharp line between academics and, and industry. And the, when we teach the course, there's no final exam because we don't them just to remember things. Instead of a final exam, they have to write an essay. What is my personal social responsibility as a computing professional? And it is, I would say it is, it is very emotionally moving to read the essay that students write because many of them I can summarize their essay by saying, I was blind and now I can see. They enter the course as techno solutionist. Any problem has a technical solution. And when they finish the course, they realize the product that I will be generating as a computer professional will impact society. And I'm responsible for the adverse consequences of that. And if you look partly what's been happening at, uh, at Google over the past few months, there is all this convulsions there, people being fired, people quitting. And it's all because of this contradiction. Google tried to, on one hand, Google has a business model which is unethical, this is surveillance capitalism. And Google is trying to promote responsible AI and ethical AI. And this contradiction, they're caught in the contradiction. And they, I don't know how they come out of this, out of this contradiction. Again, this, this, uh, they're making $150 billion a year on advertising on surveillance capitalism. They're not going to give it up. But what they cannot do is say, we are very ethical. We care about ethical and responsible AI. Every time you do a web search, you're using AI. Every time you show an advertisement, it's AI. Okay, thank you. We have now another question here from, from the uh, lecture room. Uh, uh, hi, so uh, uh, congratulations on, on the really nice talk. Uh, actually, my question is related to the last point that you uh, just made regarding how the corporates have this uh, very performative language that they have created through which they can actually perform to be very inclusive and perform to be, uh, you know, th they can come across as like talking about social justice, but, but also be quite hypocrites in that sense. Uh, the question is related to how a lot of people who are working in those corporates, they, they have this dilemma where they, they, when they're working, they feel that they are actually making some change. They have, they are doing some innovative work and they have uh, like their myopic view is very justified as to uh, how the the innovation and the uh, computer science aspect associated to them uh, is very much visible but uh, like how are they uh, not justified to uh, continue working with that uh, and like the owner shouldn't lie on the people who are work, working in those corporates to, uh, I don't know, like they, they are just the pawns. They cannot really do structural change that the people who are in control of these organizations have. So uh, like, as you said, that a person should not join Facebook. I mean, I would agree on that, but why would anyone who thinks that uh, working for Facebook uh, that person, if uh, that person will get to work on a really nice tech, which would drive actual change, and the way that it is marketed is also would be very justified to think that it would uh, actually do some 
actual structural I, I mean i don't know structural change but at least it uh, on on a broader scheme of things it would look like some change why would anybody not join uh, that and then be like no i don't want to join a corporate like facebook because it's just exploiting uh, all the, all the thank you sorry to yeah. that's the, that's yeah. the that's the uh, question, yeah. the question the, yeah. the spirit of the question so, so students very often ask me, okay, what power do I have? It boils down to what can I do to affect change? And I tell them, you have power in your fingers and in your feet. First of all, you have the power of voting because we are all citizens and uh, we are all, uh, you know, we should all vote for the policies and the politicians that we think will be the best for societal progress, even though we may have a very different interpretation of what is societal progress. But part of the idea in democracy, we are all responsible to vote in the best interest of society. The other power you have is the power of, you decide where you're going to work. You decide what product you're going to use. So I, you know, it's, it's very hard to have, um, you know, hard line and tell people don't do this or don't do that. I'm not going to tell anyone, no, do not go do not uh, work for Facebook. I mean, I have the same ethical dilemma myself that uh, I have a lot of objection to the, the way Amazon does its business, but I've been working from home and shopping from home for the last uh, now, what is it now, almost uh, 14 months. And uh, Amazon has been my lifeline, okay? Well, I'll do all my shopping on Amazon. So I'm not trying to make a promotion in from Amazon. And every time I click uh, uh, buy, I have a little moral compunction there, my supporting corporation that I don't like. So all of us have these ethical dilemmas and all we have to recognize is at the end of the day, we're all responsible for our actions. And if you work for Facebook, it's an ethical decision that you'll have to make. If you want to talk to me privately about it, it's one thing, but uh, I don't make a pronounce that I have students and friends working for Google and Facebook I do not want to say they are unethical, they're all ethical people. But I think we all need to, to ask ourselves the question, what is my social responsibility and what does it, you know, if, if I believe in this even ethical principle, what is the conclusion? It's very easy to be ethical when there's nothing at stake. It's much harder to be ethical when, uh, when you have to pay a price for being, for, for being ethical. So we all have to make this, uh, this judgment one way or another. If you find a wallet and there is money in it and nobody sees that you found a wallet, are you going to return it? Well, it's an ethical decision you have to make. And I once asked uh, uh, someone, will you return the wallet? And he said something, well, up to $1,000. So there is little money, I'll return the wallet, but otherwise if it's too much money, I'm not going to return it. So it was a joke, but uh, we have to make ethical decision and of course, some of them will have will have consequences for us. Are we willing to pay the consequences for our ethical decision? That's the ultimate test. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question from the online platform is about warranty, uh, whether warranty is um, a related topic and things of high quality come with a warranty. Not in the internet of things where software is usually accept, exempt from warranty, do you think that asking for warranties on security, availability, et cetera, might be a road to improve trust? So there's no question in my mind. So there is a, a conversation that uh, I started with a group of people in the United States uh, with the CCC, the, the Computing Communi Communities Consortia, about trying to look at cybersecurity from a techno-social perspective. So it's become very clear that uh, if you just look for a technical solution to, to cybersecurity, there isn't one. We have tried and there's no, you can just solve, technically solve the problem. It's a more complex techno-social problem. And one of the issues is we have tried to identify various externalities, okay? Um, if you're a company and you are, you have to make a decision how much to invest in cybersecurity, it's a business decision. Now suppose we require, let's imagine, we're going to, to require every, that's a critical company to carry cybersecurity insurance policy. So then there will be insurance companies and they will come and start auditing you the same way that if you buy a, a, a Volvo, 
you expect to have a, a lower uh, insurance policy on your car, you pay a lower premium because the car is safer. There will be, we're going to internalize what is now what called market externalities or economic externalities. Right now, poor security, they say it's a very far out risk. I don't, you know, I do not want to worry about it. But if we internalize it, then the company will start making decision to say, well, I want to lower my premium. If I establish this policy and security, it will, it will work better. So we have to find a way to give more incentive to companies. And liability is one way to do that. If we say, you know, if somebody sells you, for example, I'm always been flabbergasted. If you buy Windows, you have to buy security, security software on top of it. This should be embarrassing to Microsoft. The Windows should be secure in such a way that you, there's, there should be no market for, for additional security software to put on your machine because Microsoft will make it as harder, as hard and as, as, as robust as they can. Okay, um, let's maybe do two, two or three uh, more questions. Um, this one I have to read is rather long. Um, many believe that software, the software world is getting worse. One reason is the increasing number of layers on top of layers of libraries. It makes software more brittle and responsibility of bugs and error is diffused. The same happens with uh, failing bureaucracies. Uh, now we are mixing the two models. Do you think that the way to achieve division of labor without division of accountability may help? Maybe people using machine learning, but taking responsibility of <coughs> decision taking, even if aided by computer system. So the issue of the very often the issue boils down to trust. And can you trust, you want to trust the, 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 the software that you are using. Machine learning introduced a whole new uh, challenge there, which is because very often now you have a software component that are really black boxes. You know, you have a, a maybe an, an auto autonomous vehicle, an AV, and the control software has been trained by it's a very deep learn, deep model, deep learning model, deep network. And that's created a whole other kind of problems there. But level, even, even ignore it, there is a problem, for example, what do you do when you have open source software? There are many, many contributors and accountability is just very, very diffuse. So part of the issue is, again, it's driven by cost. We like, we like cheap things. And uh, they are now, we have now methodologies of, of, uh, of soft, software layers and software modules and contracts. And we could combine modularity with reliability if we take this discipline to do it. Such discipline costs money. I mean, you have to do it in some areas. You know, we are going to, if you're going to deploy a, a software, let's say we had some life critical bugs or death critical bugs in, in radiation machines, okay? And so the people who, who develop medical instruments and they have software in them, their software is subject to much, much higher reliability test because we understand it's critical and they are regulated. Again, if you look at, uh, you know, what happened with Boeing 737 MAX was a colossal failure and partly because of failure of regulation because the regulator trusted the company too much. And even regulation, there is a well-known risk that the regulators, the industry captures the regulator because of people moving between, between this and that. So, but if we said, imagine that we started, that we taught every computing uh, uh, professional on day one, when you your first course in the university, we, we tell them, guess what? Safety first. You know, the doctor have Hippocratic, Hippocratic uh, oath. First, do no harm. Imagine that we took the same attitude. First, do no harm. And we would put safety ahead of, right now, safety comes at the end. Functionality and cost come first. Imagine that we say, no, first do no harm. This is more important than functionality and cost. If we have this culture, the picture will change. We are partly, our attitude is safety something you add at the end. And all the way to design of the internet. The internet says, oh, security will, will be at a higher level. So it's not built in into the very foundation of the internet and we're paying the price for it. Okay, thank you. Um, one more question here uh, from, from the Sky Launch. I cannot hear the question.
You now hear me? Yeah, now it's better. Yes. Sorry, it's Michael yes. Stampfer. Yes. Hi, Moshe. Uh, in Hi. mathematics, there are this famous bunch of unsolved questions. Uh, and uh, my question to you is, what would be the Moshe Vardy prize or the Moshe Vardy question to the social scientists or philosophers? What kind of current problem should uh, current philosophers or social scientists tackle with much more vigor uh, regarding the problems you have uh, discussed today? I would put the social trilemma at the top, which is that uh, what we have done, and again, we've taken the, we put, we have speech on, on steroid. We have speech in a way that the, the people who wrote constitution could never imagine. So imagine you, you go back even 25 years and you want to write a, uh, let's say a pro-Nazi op-ed and publish it in the newspaper. So you wrote and you, you send it to the, to the New York Times and they would decline it. And you send it to the Washington Post and they would decline it. And you keep shopping it around Eventually, you may find a small town, a small newspaper, and it's in a racist town, and they'll publish your op-ed. And a few hundred people will read your op-ed, okay? But now you can create a, a pro-Nazi uh, YouTube, and you, you put it on YouTube, and then YouTube does this recommendation. So if you see one content, they recommend similar content, and eventually, you know, your content can reach on YouTube, your content can reach millions of people. And if you look now, we have a, a rising tide of, of extreme right wing in the United States. And when you look how people get radicalized, it's by, it's by the internet, by, you know, by essentially by social media. If you think of YouTube also as a social media, that's how people get radicalized. And if you look at very often, uh, you look at, a, at a, like Islamic radicalization, it often follows the same path. So we have given people an incredible way to amplify their speech in a way that was never conceivable until really a few years ago. And we have let the genie out of, out of the bottle. And it's not clear how you put the genie back in the bottle. And that's why I express this social dilemma. And we need social scientists and philosophers and economists all to kind of to think very hard about, I don't know there's a perfect solution, but there has to be something which is better than the current situation that we are seeing the bad effects, but we really don't know yet at, at, uh, what's the right way to find a better balance of freedom and, and uh, of regulated freedom on, on speech. Okay, um, I think this is such a nice uh, closing sentence. So I, although there are still uh, a lot of interesting questions still unanswered, but um, and because uh, time is also progressed. So uh, let's stop here. Uh, please join me thanking uh, Moshe for this very interesting uh, talk. I think uh, I mentioned the food for thought. I think uh, this food uh, Moshe provided will, will feed us for a while. Um, uh, and um, yeah, many topics uh, you, you addressed are actually uh, uh, scary, but um, fear is not, I guess, a good response and we should react in one of in this various lines uh, you you suggested thank you very much of course usually when we have the good lecture in the big audience the big lecture hall here there would be now a frenetic applause which now with these few people here it would only be a very kind of uh, um, you can still try it um, Also, usually part of the package of being a Vienna Gödel lecture uh, speaker is to be uh, taken out to a relatively fancy dinner by the dean and uh, the organizers. So I very much hope that we can um, accept the rain check for that and uh, we will do it the next time you come to Vienna, uh, which hopefully is not too far in the future. Um, yeah, thank you everybody for, for attending, for also for the good questions, but don't leave here already. Our Dean, uh, Gerti Kappel, is already waiting here and uh, she has a few closing statements. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, not only the dinner, Moshe, would be now uh, 
kind of the closing of your uh, visit, but also a present, you know, the Sacha cake. And you see the virtual Sacha cake I have in my hands. Of course, it's not only virtual, it's just on the way to your home town. But as I have heard five minutes ago, they have some delivery problems, but <laughs> it will come. Yeah? I don't know if we use Amazon or something else, but it will come. Uh, Moshe, thanks a lot for your presentation. You know, uh, if we wouldn't have our mission statement dedicated to excellence, committed to society, we would have invented just for you. You are one of the most reputed and most uh, respected computer scientists in the world. And it, it is our particular honor that you have accepted the honorary doctorate a couple of years ago from the TU Wien. You have helped to shape the future of our faculty as, as being one of the most respected members of the first International Advisory Board. And I really want to wholeheartedly thank you for all this work. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, just let me state two numbers, 50 and 3.6 million. As mentioned in the welcome address of our rector, we would have celebrated the 50th anniversary of computer science at TU Wien last year. Since 1985, since 35 years, we have compulsory courses on computer science assessment and impact on society. But as Moshi has explained very nicely in his talk, Having a single course on ethics or the like is not enough. We need also public policies. This brings me to the second number. In November 2018, it was during one of our annual International Advisory Board meetings, the term digital humanism, and I really remember the room where we have been, when I had the first time have heard this term, the term digital humanism was coined at least the first time at TU Wien, at the first time in Vienna. And it was just yesterday, not even three years later, that the Science Fund of the city of Vienna has granted 3.6 million euros for projects, for scientific projects, interdisciplinary scientific projects, in the area of digital humanism. I know this is only the very first beginning, but at least we have started and we are committed to this path. Last but not least, there was one question in the, no, you, you, uh, during your talk also, and this question was similar to another one which was put forward in the sense of, we are computer scientists. It was put forward from Manfred Breu from TU München. And he is also, you know him, Moshe, one of the very well-respected scientists. And he says, Moshe, we are computer scientists. What can we do? How can we shape policy? I know that this is a really a lasting question. I guess it will uh, continue to kind of to follow us and to, to be asked to us. We have started at the Faculty of Informatics at least the very first steps in this direction. We have started to teach our politicians in the area of digital competences. We will give the first course beginning of June, as in a couple of weeks from now. In fact, we will start here at TU Wien. They will learn what is computational thinking. They will learn that explainable AI is not explainable, explainable, at least not until now. And at least this is the first step where we try to go out of our uh, silos and help the general public and help the policy to shape the future. Moshe, thank you very much for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, here in the room and you know, out there in the, in the galaxy, thank you for joining uh, us today. And I can assure you, we will continue along this line. Thank you.